Howdy. Welcome to Osgrave Royalty. I am Justin. We are on part nine, The Shadow. Part nine of our video, ongoing video series regarding archetypes by Dr. Anthony Stevens, the great book we're covering. This is part of a larger exploration in arch archetypal psychology that we're be starting on the channel. Uh, next, we'll be covering King Warrior Magician Lover by Robert L. Moore. So look forward to that. In previous videos in this series, we talked about how archetypes and archetypal theory can affect society at large, how men and women are raised to healthier degrees or unhealthier degrees and how that permeates throughout society. I'd encourage you all to check out the previous videos in this series, of course. <clears throat> but we're now at the shadow, and we have a lot to cover here. This is going to be a kind of quote-heavy section uh, for a couple reasons. I was okay with that. First, a lot of us kind of already have an idea of what the shadow is. The critical thing here is finding out how Stevens works with it in, in terms of his view in the archetypal psychology literature. Um, yeah, and, and again, we'll be, we'll be using this concept. Stevens is great about this, how in, in articulating a concept and how it not only behaves in the lives of individuals but in but as it applies to civilizations and how we interact with each other in societies and how that affects the world so let's go ahead and get started <laughs> uh yeah time to set up some rules and regs like chet hanks would say <laughs> so starting with the definition stevens defines the shadow as Jung's term for the aspect of the self which remains unconscious because it is repressed by the superego or unactivated by the environment. And uh, it's funny, I have in my notes here that Stevens called his chapter on the shadow, Shadow, the Archetypal Enemy. And I, I like to think this is tongue-in-cheek, maybe I'm, or maybe I'm just completely misunderstanding his... Uh, <laughs> message here i don't i don't think that i am but um i mean for all its bad reputation and you know infamous characteristics uh it is a primal archetype which makes us human so i would call it i mean and thus it deserves respect so i would call it the archetypal blunt best friend yeah no it rolls right off the tongue I, uh, that is if you can find it, I suppose. So uh, it's a working title. I just released a video. <laughs> if if my I know my own schedule, I, I record a lot of. I'm recording these videos all in advance, so sometimes I get mixed up. But I have a video on the meta, as it especially in like as it applies to video games and my comments on that. And there's a phrase I like called meta slaves, who are people that are like. Okay, I don't care about what I want to do. What is the best way to, to kill people or to achieve the goal? No, no, no. I don't care about any of that. What are the biggest numbers? Don't talk to me about any of the utility or healing. No, no, no. I want big numbers. Give me the big, <laughs> you know, you get it. And there are like people who like statistically prove that this does more damage or is more effective. So, they pick that and then they're bewildered when other people pick something else and they're like, why would you not pick the best? You know, it doesn't make any sense. Anyway, I like to think that that sort of thinking causes a shadow uh, or casts a shadow in the game as a whole in, in the community. Uh, but yeah, let me, that was a random thought, but let me know what y'all think of that. So, <clears throat> excuse me. 
So the shadow is fundamentally a source of untapped archetypal power. Uh, Jung articulated that each one of us are tethered to the capital S self, and I cringely made a metaphor like this, the capital L S self is like the app store. It's got every app fully updated, whatever, but each of us are like little phones. We've got a certain set of apps that are on various degrees of being updated. Maybe some have bugs. Maybe some aren't present. Some apps aren't present there at all, but we have the capacity to get apps and update them. And that is an archetype in itself. So, uh, yes, beautiful metaphor. Good job, Justin. So, Uh, I have in my notes yet. You can know the shadow, and we'll talk about that in a moment. It's not just fully cloaked from us. So, also, it's in, in my opinion, it's more important to be aware of the shadow than like to incorporate to, to attempt to incorporate it. Of course, that's important. Um, so I'm, I say like in, engaging with the shadow is about an increase in free will. You can't choose something that you're not aware is an actual aware of as an actual choice. Tapping into the shadow merely illuminates the choices you didn't think you were allowed to choose. With more choices comes more personal power in your life. That is the whole point. It is not about right or wrong. From my own experience, it's been enough for me to name what I lack. As soon as I do, that quality loses its repressive power because I'm aware that I lack it. At that moment, I fail to be insecure about it. It's the old saying that naming something gives you the power over it. Like, that sums up my personal attitude toward shadow work. And I, I say here, uh, and these are my own thoughts, kind of using s archetypes as a source and just from what I've heard from various sources. I'm not quoting anybody here. Um, I say everyone has a shadow. No one escapes it. You don't need to run from it. The only being that... Um, might not have one as God, but that's a different discussion. And yeah, not everyone can have every quality. No one ever reaches their maximum potential archetypal archetypally, just like no one has ever been in perfect health. Does that mean that aiming for perfect health or individuation is just a pointless endeavor? Hell no. Um, I think about entropy and thermodynamics, where like the universe is slowly decaying at every moment. It has to do with systems theory, but that's a whole nuanced thing. It, again, with everything I'm saying here, do your own research. Don't take my word for anything. I'm average intelligence. I'm just a fan of all this stuff. So, yeah, go go look into it yourself. I'm just sending up the flare. Um, so uh, I think, like, the good news, like, the good news about the shadow is that at every moment it's trying to integrate with you. It's like reverse entropy for our minds. It's always calling to you in the form of defense mechanisms, and we'll get to that in a moment. And um, it, it just comes from our innate archetypal drive to actualize our potential. If you ignore it your whole life, it'll come into your dreams. And uh, we'll talk more about the transcendent function in our next and uh, and next part. We talked about both hemispheres and how the brain speaks to itself through communication between the hemispheres, which each have kind of their own reality that they live in, the left being like the really logical, the right being the really intuitive. So the better they're communicating, the more individuated you are, TLDR, oversimplifying. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and this goes back to a great, fantastic quote that Jung had, and hope you're sitting down. But he said, what we fail to make conscious will be acted out unconsciously and we will call it fate. Again, what we fail to make conscious will be acted out unconsciously and we will call it fate. <sighs> so, <clears throat> Stephen says, Guilt and the fear that guilt induces are at the root of the shadow problem. Um, that we go to such uh, devious efforts as we do to keep the sh shadow unconscious is because conscious acceptance of one's own evil until uh, 
instills sufferings one own one owns guilt through that suffering participating in the guilt of mankind without suffering there is no salvation uh, to work on my reading skills uh, um i i think i yeah so yeah basically <clears throat> um like basically the what the point is is that like i mentioned earlier i think the shadow is a necessary tool for human survival that we'd be unable to really survive really if uh like our full evil was made right in front of us fully conscious and that's why the shadow kind of gets buried. It's a survival strategy. And, but, um, yeah. And again, without suffering, there is no salvation. It's individuation would be impossible without some, some confrontation with trying to wrangle your, your shadow characteristics. And I mentioned, uh, I've mentioned the personal development school, PDS, the channel run by Thais Gibson. She talks about the golden shadow, um, which is you can also bury your positive qualities. Maybe you thought you were funny, but no one in your family did. So you're like, oh, I'm not, I'm not a funny person. Or you drew something and like, oh, you're just, not, it's not very good. So you think, oh, I'm not artistic. And you just bury that. But maybe you are. And those have been repressed, you know? So you can have good qualities buried in the shadow as well. I thought that was a good observation. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so about the origins of the, of the shadow, Stephen says, as a defense against the catastrophe of abandonment, the superego is established as an inner watchdog whose function is to monitor our behavior so as to ensure relative conformity to the values of the culture into which we have happened happen to have been born. The superego is, therefore, the bedrock of character and culture. It is the psychic organ that makes society possible. And you can think of like a, uh, a pure supo, super egoic person is like the meta slave. They're like, they've been, they are like, I think that, you know, imagine a person who listens to only the popular music and only the popular movies and only reads the New York times bestsellers and basically, <clears throat> and only talks about, you know, safe topics. This person would be a complete monstrosity. Uh, like someone so, so perfectly in tune with their culture. It's all, it's almost, it's morbid. Like, there is no raw, unique self left. Like, society has done a number on them, and all they can do is do what society tells them to do. And, and I mean, it's tragic, but... <clears throat> um, Stephen says, the personal price we pay for acquiring a superego is a serious loss of freedom for the self. For this inner policeman bugs the... I, I love this. Yeah, Stevens is a great writer. For, for this inner policeman bugs the lines of communication along the ego self-axis. And when he hears anything he deems disreputable, dangerous, or subversive, he intervenes to make us feel guilty, and not infrequently, he cuts the wires. Thus, the very milieu that makes actualization of the self possible also demands that certain components of the self remain unactualized in the unconscious or be actively repressed there. In our own culture, these unacceptable elements have been traditionally stigmatized as man's animal nature or beast within. Jung called them, collectively, the shadow. And there you have it. Um, yeah, again... we've already talked about how we're archetypally prepared to enter a society. That may sound like a simple statement, but it's worth reviewing the past videos to really unpack the ramifications of what all it, that means. But y'all, we're on part nine here. I mean, this is advanced. Y'all get it. We're, we're moving on. So, 
but again, yeah. Um, if if you're poorly initiated, and I'm thinking about men here, men, you know, died much more often in war, conflict, disease, everything than than women. So, um, like, like the tribe often is held together by a certain set of customs. And we talked about this in, in the initiation part. If your shadow's out of control and you can't, and you have no super ego, um, you're, you're a waste of resource. You're like a waste of space. You're just too raw. And it's important to have initiated men because initiated men are what hold up and, help your society thrive. So I think I said something there. And uh, yeah, this, this reminds me. So there's a, uh, an expression the Stoics had called the obstacle is the way. I think it's a book by Ryan Holiday. Um, basically, it means that, again, the obstacle is the way. If there's an obstacle, maybe you should go into it rather than try and go around it. Because by going through it, you are transformed. I'm, these are my own words, but transformed and, and grow, and there, that's where the growth is, you know. So, unfortunately, the greatest moments in your life come in the guise of like these VIP invitations to improving your life come in the guise of challenges, which is unfortunate, but. Um, Stevens kind of talks uh, about that a little bit here. He says, ego defense mechanisms have been clearly defined by psychoanalysis, and the most important of them are projection, intellectualization, display, displacement, and reaction formation, repression, and denial. I'm not going to go through all those here, probably for uh, another video. But he says, seeing through these defense mechanisms and perceiving how they work is more than half the battle in making the shadow conscious. It is, therefore, essential that we look into them. Again, it was my opinion earlier, and uh, Stevens is saying this here, awareness is like 90%. It, it gives you so much power over the shadow by just recognizing elements of it within yourself. And again, the obstacle is the way by looking at your own projection, intellectualization, and so on, repression, denial, the more you can make the, con the unconscious conscious, again, until you make the con unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. This is how you're increasing your own free will. And again, I'm, I'm really into ethics. My background is in philosophy and I'm not, I'm not saying that out of any kind of authority. I mean, that's just where my interests lie, but I liked, um, I wasn't so much into metaphysics and epistemology, although I respected them. I'm really into like ethics. Um, so, Yeah, like you, there's an argument to be made that you become more ethical when you have a greater sense of free will. Because if you, the person who doesn't have any free will is not even a moral agent. Um, but yeah, that, that's uh, maybe for another time we'll talk about that. Let me know in the comments below what y'all think about any of this. So Stevens goes on, human individuals in human society complement one another. They cannot exist independently because they evolve together. Our potential for culture resides in our biology as a species. We live in societies because we are social animals. Very Aristotelian there. As babies, each of us is born unfinished with an evolutionary path in the social future goal in, in, we, in the culture needed in the culture to complete us. Um, some typos there. Um, right. So yeah, we're, again, we're primed for culture out of the bag. Um, and it's largely, shadow work is largely about reclaiming what was lost. Um, having to mold into your culture, even though molding into your culture is, has survived roots in survival of the species. And, this again, I, I mentioned it before, but it again reminds me of Jonathan Peugeot's video on dwarves and goblins and how they embed a sort of 
uh, ir eradicable rascality, to use Alan Watts's great phrase, like for cars, right? Cars are great inventions, and goblins and dwarves are known for like being tinkerers and inventors. So cars, great on the technology front, but what else? What what's the cost? What's the trickster element there? That we're all in steel metal boxes, atomized from one another. We don't interact on during our travels anymore. We don't encounter nature at all. It's very far removed, et cetera, et cetera. We've almost lost as more of, as as of what we've gained. <clears throat> Let me know what you think about that. So. Yeah, again, um, awareness is, is the key. Again, it's about the shadow is largely a pile of the remnants of the limbs of ourself that we've cut off to fit in. And I, I had this thought that I brought this up before that Alan Watts' point about self-help, how he said like, how is the self that's going to do the helping? How is that? How is that self the same self as the self that needs the help itself? <laughs> like, it seems like there's a conflict of interest. It's like pulling yourself by your own bootstraps. He says, like the self that is supposed to do the helping is somehow supposed to is somehow also the self that needs the help in the first place. You know, um, and I, I thought about this as well. Like another great like point on top of that is what does self-improvement mean? Like, how do you improve yourself? You know, let's say you become better at making money. Okay. Um, yes, that's a skill, but like, have you helped yourself like metaphysically? And it's an open question as, uh, you know, it's an open question as to whether the opportunity cost of the effort it takes to make a lot of money is worth it. You know, the counter argument, which is very unpopular these days, but you can't take it with you, you know, when you die, like, I guess, you know, where are your values? So yeah, it's like in, Who's to say what's better and what isn't? And that's largely dictated by the culture we find ourselves in to an extent. So even self-help itself is misleading in that way. Because you have to help yourself in a direction, but the standards of what makes a better direction over another is dictated by your society, which seems to, based on what we've covered, be... Uh, inexorably tied to the shadow, to alienated parts. So yeah, it's a uh, prickly, prickly issue. <laughs> it's a thorny issue, as Norm would say, Norm MacDonald. <laughs> it's a thorny issue. So um, Stevens talks more about like the shadow and its tie into the survival of the species as a whole. So he says, only by coming consciously to terms with our nature, and in particular with the nature of the shadow, can we avert, can we hope to avert total catastrophe? In other words, there is an urgent biological imperative to make the shadow conscious. Both individuation and planetary salvation demand that we be aware of our capacity to good, do good and evil. For, sorry, our capacity for good and evil, and that we make ethical choices between the two. Too single-minded a pursuit of utopia results in a wholesale repression of the self and, ultimately, the triumph for the shadow. Listen to that back. We got to move on, but that is some epic stuff. Again, in other words, there is an urgent biological imperative to make the shadow conscious. Who has their hand on the big red button? A human being. What does a human being have? A shadow. Has that being processed their shadow? It's an open question. So, again, aggression is one of these things we throw in the, into the shadows. He, he, Stephen says that aggression should be regarded as an essential... Sorry, aggression 
that aggression should be regarded as an essential part of our biological equipment, like pain, pain, hunger, thirst, or sex, is a view totally at odds with the influential behaviorist belief that aggressive behavior is acquired <laughs> through video games, of course, and occurs when it does occur purely as a response to frustration. Furthermore, if true, the view that aggression is innate and therefore ineradicable unfortunately cut the ground from beneath the feet of the social theorists who argue that violent crime, cruelty, and war could be abolished from human affairs, affairs simply by changing the social system in such a way to minimize frustration, like increasing national wealth, em eliminating social inequality, etc. He says, ethology adopts a much broader approach to the matter, arguing that aggression, no less than sexuality, contributes to the survival of the species. It performs vital biological functions. These may be summarized as follows. One, it promotes defense. Two, access to valu valuable resources like territory, food, water, females. Three, it ensures good use of the available habitat by spreading its population out as widely as possible. Four, it affords an effective means of settling disputes within the group. Five, it provides leadership that the group, a in the group, so a factor which can prove critical for survival in times of danger. And six, it promotes the different, uh, differential reproduction, aka the fittest, more aggressive and dominant males are more likely to sire the next generation and so on selective, so on and pass on selectively advantageous genes. There's a debate I have there that, um, well, I've mentioned that in another, another video, maybe you can point that out, but it has to do with dual mating strategies. So he, he says thus, to summarize the ethological view, aggression is a fundamental and ineradicable characteristic of all social ma mammals, including man. Without aggression, survival would be impossible, but survival also demands that aggression be constrained. These human aberrations aside, the main function of the dominance hierarchy is used to control aggressive competition in the interest of social cohesion. That maintenance of the hierarchy is crucial for the group may be uh, judged from the mayhem that results when it is disturbed. The most potent cause of aggression is the threat of destruction of the established social organization. What matters, after all, is that we are is that not that we are aggressive, xenophobic, sexual, hierarchical, and territorial, but what attitude should we adopt in these fundamental a priori aspects of our nature, how we live with them, and how we mediate them to the group? It is the ethical orientation that counts. However, in order to be ethical, one must be conscious, and consciousness means awareness of things as they really are. We have to abandon the romantic dream that evil, conflict, and aggression can be banished from human affairs because it is when we deny our own capacity for evil that we project or displace it on others. So, uh, not much time left. Um, but he has an interesting note that Stephen says, religions are like other biological phenomena. They evolved in directions which enhance the welfare of those who have them. Elementary religions gave way to more sophisticated ones that were sort of through a sort of cultural Darwinism. Those which promoted survival gain adherence and grow. Less successful religions lose adherence and disappear. The anthropologist Anthony Wallace, Wallace has es estimated that we have in the course of our evolution produced somewhere in the region of 100,000 sort uh, religions of one sort or another. And he calls uh, he talks about the barbarian, which is one whose ethical complex has failed to mature. Someone who has n done no shadow work. Imagine a barbarian's hand on the button. Um, last thing, uh, he has this great game you can play to find out qualities of your shadow called the kind of person I cannot stand. You just create the epitome of that and. That should get you started in extracting your shadow qualities. But we got to end it here. See you in the next one. We'll talk about the transcend function. Comment down below. Relevant links in the description. Have a good one, y'all. Take care. Bye-bye.